I am in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible now. Yes. Please okay. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, sorry for the uh, inconvenience. So uh, today's lecture brings together two metaphors: the metaphor of Prometheus and the metaphor of Deus ex machina. Uh, I'm sure we are familiar with both these ideas, and in the handout that uh, was distributed, I'm sure uh, you you have uh, for the beginners definitely. Uh, you have gone through the myth of Prometheus as well as uh, the idea of Deus ex machina. Most literature people would definitely uh, be familiar with uh, these ideas as well. Now, uh, dear friends, let me begin with a quotation. And in all fairness, you know, this quotation shouldn't be about about literature it should be from the mechanical world it should be from the engineering world it should be from uh, the world of technology because we are talking post humanism and uh, we should give due credits uh, to technology as well and i am quoting a, a, a statement made by blaise pascal the famous French mathematician who invented the Pascaline, one of the earliest mechanical calculators, a pioneering device whose uh, you know, invention is considered to be uh, the precursor of all modern computers and internet technology. And the invention of uh, or, or the design principles behind uh, the creation of this Pascaline were so instrumental and so path breaking in the evolution of computer technology that a programming language known as Pascal was named in honor of him. When we were students, we were taught, you know, we, we, we were, uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, we were taught uh, three computer languages, basic, COBOL and Pascal. And this Pascal, this Blaise Pascal made a very interesting statement. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing except by God the creator. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing except by God the creator. I'm pretty sure that um, this quotation would suit any uh, religious sermon. But why am I talking about this here? Obviously, I am talking about the, the confluence, the juxtaposition of technology and divinity, technology and spirituality, technology and uh, mysticism, science and Technology, And I believe that post-humanism is a lot about this confluence, about this, uh, you know, coming together, embracing of science and technology on the one hand and mysticism or religion or spirituality or God on the other hand. During the successful launch of uh, Chandrayaan 2, we saw how the scientific community is connected with the idea of God, about the idea of this God-shaped vacuum, which they try to fill. And the unbound dreams of many an Indian with a Promethean spirit resulted in the launch of this machine called the Chandrayaan. The machine went up even as Akni, the god of fire, reigned on the launch site. You know how a rocket goes up. Now, uh, my dear friends, when we look at post-humanism, this lecture is mostly about the notion of the divine within post-humanism. How much share do God have, do religions have, do spirituality have in or within post-humanism? And why I am doing this? Because... I want to give you a better understanding. As a keynote speaker, I would like to give a better understanding of the 
basic precepts of post-humanism, transhumanism, anti-humanism, and bioconservative ethics. And to do this, I have brought in these two metaphors. The figure of Prometheus, uh, you know, the mythical character who brought fire into the world of humans, and the device called Deus Ex Machina, the god from the machine that we had in Greek theater. Now, let's look at the first one, post-humanist as an unbound Prometheus. We know the story of Prometheus from mythology. We know the story of Prometheus as narrated by Percy B. Shelley in, uh, in, 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 uh, um, in his play, uh, Prometheus Unbound. We know multiple versions of the story of Prometheus. What we have here, when we do this juxtaposition, is a compelling narrative that highlights the complex interplay between technology, ethics, literature, and mythology within the post-human Promethean framework. Think of Prometheus as a technological pioneer. He stole fire from the gods and gave it to humanity. And it could very well symbolize the acquisition of a new technology. Similarly, post-humanism seeks to liberate human potential through advanced technology and how transcending natural human limitations. So what would happen when Prometheus is unbound? Uh, think of Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley's wife, Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, you know, students would very well recall, is subtitled the modern Prometheus. What happens in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? The novel explores the consequences of unrestrained scientific experimentation. What does post-humanism post do? Post-humanism, on similar lines, raises ethical questions about the boundaries of technological advancement. Again, in the myth, Prometheus's actions challenges challenge God's authority. Post-humanism with its ambitions of uh, transcending human limitations through genetic engineering, cryonics, whatever, similarly challenges ultimate authority. Why can't we think about the quest for immortality as a connecting thread? Prometheus's action were driven in part by the desire to grant immortality to human beings. Post-humanism too claims it's the same. It claims that it wants to give us immortality through genetic engineering, through nanotechnology. Think about the ideas of freedom and liberation. Just as Prometheus was unbound from his chains, post-humanism can be seen as a liberation from the constraints or the constraining ideas of human biological limitations. Both concepts emphasize the idea of a complete breaking free. Prometheus unbound post-humanism at large. Again, think about human enhancement, a central theme in post-humanism. This idea can be linked to Prometheus's gift of fire. Just as Prometheus's gift of fire elevated humans by giving them the power to control their own environment, technology in post-humanism aims to enhance human capabilities and potentialities. I hope the metaphor is clear. The first part of the metaphor is clear. Now let's look at the second metaphor. How I am giving this metaphor is uh, to give you a better idea of how to understand these diverse concepts associated with post-humanism. Let's look at the second uh, metaphor, post-humanism as Deus ex machina, or the post-humanist himself as Deus ex machina, the god from the machine. I hope the metaphor is very clear. You know, on the one hand, Deus ex machina could refer to technology because it is a technology where uh, in the stage, uh, a god descends 
solving all the problems in, in a drama. And that is the second part to it. It is not only technology, it is a part of literature. It is a part of arts and humanities. It is a literary device. It is a literary technique. So a confluence of technology on the one hand and literature or arts on the other. So uh, think of the idea of God as technology or technology as God, the technological God in both post-humanism and Deus Ex Machina, it is technology that brings God. Emergence of artificial intelligence as deities. If you think about our advanced AI systems, we can say that these AI systems parallel the gods descending from the machine. AI can be viewed as modern day deities. You know, chat GPT is a modern deity. All these things are modern deities that humans have created. And why have we created these deities? To change the script of the tale of human beings. This is the god descending from the machine changes the entire framework of the story, of the play. This god the hum that the human beings have created changes the script of the tale called humanity. In post-humanism, man plays God through genetic engineering. In classical literature, we can see, we have seen how gods play with the destinies of mortals. Remember Shakespeare, as flies to wanton boys are we to gods. They kill us for their spot. Who knows when, when, when I, I don't say whether, who knows when these technologies will kill us as flies to want boys. Even consider the theme of transcendence in both contexts. In Deus Ex Machina, characters often transcend their moral and mortal uh, limitations with divine aid. While post-humanism seeks to transcend human limitations, moral and mortal, through technological means. In Deus Ex Machina, gods descend. In post-humanism, we witness the descending of gods, in a metaphorical sense, the descending of gods in stature, in position, because man or technology, Technology that play gods are mostly inferior and often evil incarnations of God. So gods, the idea of gods descend. It also encapsulates the idea of the human desire to master fate. In traditional literature, this mastery over fate was achieved through the supernatural. While in post-humanism, this mastery is achieved through scientific and technological advancements. And if we look at the artificially engineered solutions or artificial solutions, artificial or engineered solutions, you know, just as God's in interventions in Greek theater were artificial or engineered, Deus Ex Machina, post-humanism often involves artificial augmentation, such as the merging of humans with machines, the development of artificial intelligence, or even genetic modification. And, and, and the biggest narrative of all, of these that connect these two uh, narratives, the shift in narrative, Deus Ex Machina shifts the narrative of a story abruptly. Similarly, post-humanism represents an abrupt radical shift in the narrative of the story of man. And this is where I, I would want to, you know, keep these metaphors aside and take you to something else. These ideas invite our attention to the notion of the post-human God. This is where I want to take you. The post-human God, the idea that post-humans 
who are no longer confined by humanness of being human can grow so powerful as to appear godlike the concept of a post human god is common these days in science fiction and um i'm reminded of arthur c clark the uh, you know uh, the uh, extremely interesting sci-fi author who once said in an interview that it may be that uh, our role on the planet is not to worship god but to create him our role in this planet could well be not to worship god but to create him don't think of me as a blasphemous person don't think of me as an atheist i am none of these not at all the idea of intelligence explosion i would say is even more interesting if not frightening if not unsettling what is intelligence explosion the idea is that if machines could even slightly surpass human intelligence they could very well improve their own designs in ways unforeseen by their designers and thus augment themselves into far greater intelligence the prospect is unthinkable as the machines become more intelligent they would become better at becoming more intelligent which could lead to an exponential and quite sudden growth in intelligence and this would probably lead to the creation of an ultra intelligent machine what is this idea of the ultra intelligent machine you can define it as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual processes all the intellectual activities of the cleverest human being ever whether uh, it is pragyananda or whether it was albert einstein this ultra intelligent one intel ultra intelligent machine you create it and it will far surpass everything that any human being ever could have ever done such an ultra intelligent machine could design even better machines and the intelligence of man would be left far behind then what might happen is the invention of the first ultra intelligent machine will also be man's last invention the invention of the first ultra intelligent machine will also be man's last inter- invention why ai may simply eliminate the human race and humans would be powerless to stop them you know uh, i'm sure you are familiar with isaac asimov's uh, three laws of uh, robotics he says robots should follow three laws in uh, you know this is something that he has formulated throughout his stories isaac asimov so what he says first law robots um, you know uh, should not hurt human beings or do or think anything that would hurt human beings first law second law robots should obey human beings provided that obeying doesn't violate the first law which is not to harm human beings and the third law is uh, robots have every right to um, you know to survive to take care of their own existence provided this taking care of their own existence won't interfere with the first two laws these are the three laws of robotics according to um, isaac asimov now these laws i would say are one of the uh, earliest examples of proposed safety measures for ai we need certain measures in place so that we can keep these artificial intelligence devices these robots in check the laws are intended to prevent prevent artificially intelligent robots from harming humans and it will not go extinct and you know i'm giving you an interesting perspective if we will not go extinct before becoming post humans then 
It can be scientifically proven that post-humanists probably exist already. And they are more benevolent than us. And they created us and our world. Because post-humanists come from the future. If there are, if we don't get extinct before we become post-humans, it is logical to think that there are post-humans already. And we are their creations. We are our world, their creation. This is uh, this is the point. And am I audible? I heard some. Okay. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are yes, audible. Hi. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is, how would it feel to be a post-human? Sometimes we all have similar doubts. You know, am I a figment in the imagination of a future post-human? Is this conference itself taking place in the memories of some post-human? Who knows? Who knows? I don't have answers to these questions. Now, transhumanism believes, I'm coming to the next uh, idea called transhumanism. Transhumanism believes that we are becoming not only post-humans, but also gods. It means that some of the qualities that we traditionally attribute to exclusively to God are now accessible and reachable to us human beings. According to transhumanism, these uh, qualities of God can eventually be achieved via science and technology. To put it in a literary way, in an, uh, in an aesthetic, uh, theological way, technology is the golden key to access the forbidden fruit of apotheosis, of godliness. If you want to attain the forbidden fruit called apotheosis, if you want to become God, apotheosis, becoming God. So if you want to becoming, become God, Technology is the key. Technology is the key. This is what um, transhumanists would say. Now, what are these qualities of God? And how can human beings achieve these qualities? I would just name if, uh, you know, two or three qualities and we will briefly look at those qualities and see how technology can help us become gods. Of course, in a, uh, you know, metaphorical sense. Now, gods are con con uh, considered to be immortal, amatya, and the alpha and the omega, the endless. Gods are considered to be all-knowing, omniscient, and gods are considered all-encompassing. Let's look at these three ideas. Now, gods are immortal. One specific goal that we usually attribute to transhumanism is human enhancement. Human enhancement through genetic engineering, probably. As per the transhumanist narrative, immortality can be understood as radical life extension. Immortality is radical life extension. It may eventually be fulfilled through gene editing and prenatal genetic modification. And then what can happen? So this is also interesting. What can happen uh, if... Sorry. Okay. Okay, I'm getting notifications of people joining. Yeah, I, I hope I made the host. Okay. Uh, that's fine. So um, now if this happens, unlike man, a computer-based intelligence is not tied to a body. We all are tied to bodies. We all have bodies which are mortal, bodies which will die. But computer intelligence is not tied to any particular body. And so... It is not fallible. Or in other words, a software intelligence would essentially be immortal and 
so it will have no need to produce children it doesn't have to produce independent children that live on after it dies because you know the whole idea of evolution is based on uh, the idea that we will die and we will need progeny to carry forward um, the species and so what happens with these technology is that uh, technological gadgets or, or, or technological software intelligence would be immortal and so it will have no need to produce children to carry forward its legacy. It would then and thus have no evolutionary need for love. And by extension, it would have nothing to do with emotions. Now, I leave it here, the first point, how we can become immortal through technology. Second point, God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. How do we achieve this all-knowingness? There is this beautiful concept called dataism. You know, we even today we are fighting wars over theism and atheism. Belief in God and no, no belief in God. Theism and atheism. But here we have a third prospect, dataism. Now, how can we become all-knowing? It can be achieved through internet and big data. Earlier, whenever we were encountered with a question that we didn't know, we, we used to say, God alone knows. But now we say, I do not know, but the internet knows. Sometimes we say, I know, but internet knows better than I do. This is our new precept, our new motto. The internet knows everything. This view, known as dataism, um, developed by um, you know, the TED, TED talker, the great speaker, Yuval uh, Noah Harari, the Israeli uh, you know, thinker and historian, is dataism, according to him, is an emerging ideology according to which big data becomes the supreme value to the point that it could eventually replace traditional religious beliefs and turn itself into a new religion, all-knowing religion, all-answering religion, no dogmas. The third quality of God, the quality of being all-encompassing. And here, I'm sure you are familiar these ideas because we all are familiar with Donna Harave and she in her um, you know celebrated 1985 essay what is it a cyborg manifesto she says and uh, I will just quote a few sentences from a cyborg manifesto I'm quoting from uh, Donna Harave so she says our best machines are made of sunshine. They are all light and clean because they are nothing but signals, electromagnetic waves, uh, a section of the spectrum. People are nowhere near so fluid, being both material and opaque. Cyborgs are ether, E-T-H-E-R quintessence, end of quote. So on the one hand, technology is invisible like God, like magnetic waves or signals and extremely transparent, light, clean, like light itself. On the other hand, technology has a definite dark side. The dark side can probably be the ethical, you know, all the ethical concerns, the lack of digital privacy. Think of it. Everything is traceable today. Everything is recordable today. Everything is possibly archived. This lecture is archived. This is being recorded. This button on the side of the screen tells me this lecture is recorded. So, you know, what privacy do any one of us have? We live in the panopticon society. We know the uh, Foucaultian idea of the panopticon, but I would say not exactly the panoptic of Foucault, because in 
Foucault span of thick in, in that example of the prison, there is a guard standing on the tower watching all the prisoners and the prisoners don't know whether they are being watched and they live in perennial fear. Now, uh, in this new panoptic created by technology, what happens is uh, the guard watching over the prisoners from the high tower has lost his power. Or I would say the guard has lost his tower, its centrality, the deconstructive side of uh, post humanism. The guards may be watching the prisoners, but the prisoners may be watching the guards too. This is the point. Guards can watch the prisoners, but the prisoners might also be watching the guards. So, you know, the kind of um, what what uh, Foucault would call, you know, no, not Foucault, what Derrida would call embracing the margins, romancing them, you know. Deconstruction is something that you do without romancing the margin. So all are given centrality or, or we do away with this concept of center and margins. And we think of uh, the prisoners as well as the guard as, as equal in the hierarchy and they are being watched. This, this is frightening, but this is interesting also. And utilitarian trans uh, humanist uh, thinker, philosopher, um, you know, David Pierce, uh, he, uh, I cannot recall the title of the book. I have given that reference in, in the handout. So uh, he propounds the idea of the hedonistic imperative, which outlines how genetic engineering and nanotechnology will abolish all suffering in all sentient life. Isn't it good? There is no suffering. Um, he says, David Pierce says, technology is very good. Nanotechnology is very good. Genetic engineering is very good because it will abolish all suffering. Even God hasn't done that. So technology can. He calls it paradise engineering. We are engineering a paradise through, um, through technology. And it will result in the complete abolition of all sorts of suffering. And according to Pierce, um, you know, the circle of compassion should eventually, I'm, I'm quoting, the circle of compassion should eventually include other animals via ecosystem redesign in genetic engineering. But what is he saying? We have to not only think about human beings, but we have to think about other animals too when we do genetic engineering. He continues, redesigning the global ecosystem extends the prospects of paradise engineering to the rest of the living world. It looks good on the outside. Yeah, well, you know, we, you know, we, we, we have a fruit. Let us share it with our animal friends too the rest of the living world. Look at the statement closely and we can see how human exceptionalism, what we call anthropocentrism or absolutism is ingrained in the processes of genetic engineering and nanotechnology. And post-humanists don't like this idea. It's not just about the living world, right? Such a perspective is far from ideal, far from uh, desirable in the view of a post-humanist. Obviously, what I'm talking about is transhumanism. So obviously, transhumanism is very much rooted in anthropocentrism, man-centered. Transhumanism is man-centered. Now, when you speak about paradise engineering, when you speak about immortality, think, look at it. This Transhumanist philosophers here wax eloquent on terms and ideas such as immortality and transcendence and paradise. So, is transhumanism theistic? Not a theistic? Theistic. Is transhumanism theistic? Not at all. For the most part, you know, transhumanism is anchored on a, you know, uh, atheistic principles and premises. 
some of the leading voices these days uh, in, in the transhumanist movement, they have taken an explicit standpoint against normative religions. Then why do these people talk about immortality and paradise and transcendence? Why? At a closer scrutiny, it becomes quite obvious that within the transhumanist discourse, technology is re replacing the role of religion. Technology is the new religion. In the transhumanist narrative, technology becomes the drive to fulfill man's quest to fill that vacuum, fill that God-shaped vacuum that is that Pascal spoke about for meaning, for fulfillment. Bioethicists like John Harris argue that human enhancement is hence morally good because it makes us better people. Being better people. Well, what are we talking about? Definitely we are talking about the next stage in human evolution. And we are engineering that evolution. In, 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 in the book, uh, The Age of Spiritual Machines, published in 1999, a very um, interesting book, which, which has a lot of literary uh, and uh, aesthetic parallels. Uh, in this book, Ray Kurzweil states that technology on Earth is not merely the private affair of one of the Earth's innumerable species. It's not, our, it's not the business of only us. It is a pivotal event in the history of the planet, he says. Evolution's grandest creation, human intelligence, is providing the means for the next stage of evolution, which is technology. Technology is the next stage of evolution as far as human beings or this planet itself is concerned. Why don't, don't we think sometimes? See, people have said that we have come up from monkeys and all those things. Now, why have the monkeys uh, maybe uh, 5,000 years ago or human beings 5,000 years ago and the human beings today don't have any change? But don't we see the change? The hu those human beings did not have this hanging on the side of their ears. They did not have something plugged into their ears. They did not have this. They did not have this. They may have other variants, but they have a lot of technological gadgets. And they, of course, did not have this. Social media or Zoom meetings, uh, con you know, digital conferences, nothing. The next stage of human evolution, technology. And... In this evolutionary interpretation, human intelligence becomes evolution's grandest creation and technology is destined and determined to be its worthy successor. Now, Sir Julian Huxley, next students would say that he coined the term transhumanism. Julian Huxley, the British evolutionist, evolutionary biologist. He had his ideas firmly rooted in anthropocentrism and technocentrism as well. He had firm belief in man as the center. He had firm belief as technology as man's assistant. In his book, um, New Bottles for New Wine, published in 1957, James Hux, Julian Huxley states that man's responsibility and destiny is to be an agent for the rest of the world. For what? It is as if man had been subtly appointed the managing director of the biggest business of all. What is the biggest business? The business of evolution. And Huxley continues, what is more, he can't refuse the job. We have to be managing directors of this business called evolution. Thus, what I'm trying to convey is starting with Huxley, the person who coined the term transhumanism, the human is seen as the species in charge 
of the next steps of evolution. And this anthropocentrism, this human exceptionalism is at the center of transhumanism, which is challenged by posthumanism. Now, are we really playing gods? There is a realistic chance we are playing gods. There is a realistic chance that man may eventually extend life so radically so as to gain immortality. And this has invited a lot of controversy and a lot of criticism, a lot of opposition to transhumanism. But why should people speak against this call for immortality? Like Yayati, we all want to become immortal, right? We, none of us want to die. So what is this problem with becoming immortal? This question, why, has been asked by bioconservative ethics, ethicists. But what they ask is to be or not to be. To be or not to be what? To be or not to be genetically modified. Do I want to be genetically modified? Do I want my child or my grandchild to be genetically modified? Here, the idea of the designer baby is interesting, a controversial one. The designer baby, who is a designer baby or what is a designer baby? A designer baby is a baby whose genetic makeup has been intentionally selected or modified by his or its parents and doctors so that it possesses specific desired traits or characteristics such as such an eye color, uh, my child would want eyes like Aishwarya Rai, intelligence like Albert Einstein, physical uh, uh, appearance like Hrithik Roshan, or resistance to diseases, enhanced capabilities, etc. It looks interesting. Then what is the problem? Through gene editing, you can select different traits by adding or removing genetic material. And it raises numerous ethical moral and societal concerns. The question is, should we, should we as a species proceed towards that inexorable path towards a future of genetically engineered designer babies? It's not, it's no longer a question of can we, it's definitely a question of should we, because we can, obviously we can. But should we do that? Transhumanists say, yes, we should do that. Bioconservative ethicists say, no, wait, we shouldn't do that. Now, bioconservative ethicist Francis Fukuyama, he says uh, in the essay that is quoted, uh, you know, uh, in the handout I have given, he says that transhumanism is the day, is the most dangerous idea of the 21st century. Hmm. German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, maybe uh, you are not con uh, convinced by Fukuyama, then I will call it Habermas. He stresses on the urgent need for legal strategies to protect personal identity, which may lead to the legal recognition and protection of the right to a genetic inheritance immune from artificial intelligence. I need to have the right to make sure that I am not genetically engineered. My child should have the right to ensure that he is not genetically engineered. According to this view, Future generations of human beings should have the right not to be genetically enhanced. The, the opposition is very clear. There is a big difference, big hiatus between the transhumanist position and the bioconservative one. My dear, we talk about the death of God. We talk about the death of the author. We talk about so many deaths. Are we killing gods? Are we killing gods? According to Foucault, Michel Foucault, the human has already...
already died. Foucault's notion of the death of man is primarily a critique of humanism, a philosophical and cultural tradition. You know, what is humanism? Man is at the crown of creation. All those things we have, we, we know, man, uh, you know, all those things. So his, it, his idea is a critique of humanism, which places human beings as the center or at the center of the universe and emphasizes the importance of human reason, agency, human identity. And Foucault believed that with the rise of modernity, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries, new discourses and systems of knowledge have emerged that have rendered the traditional humanist concept of man obsolete. That is why he says man is dead. He, he speaks about the death of man. So the death of man does not imply the literal extinction of human beings, but rather the end of a particular way of thinking about humanity. And this type of human was born in the European Enlightenment. And when did he die? He died with the death of God, according to Friedrich Nietzsche, and the birth of the Ubermensch, what Nietzsche calls Ubermensch, the overman or the superman. Nietzsche, on his part, envisioned a future, and think about what Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's picture was, and see how similar it is to what we are doing with genetic engineering and post-humanism. Nietzsche envisaged, envisioned a future in which individuals would overcome the constraints of traditional morality and create their own values. He introduced the concept of the ubermensch, superman, overman, representing individuals who would transcend the limitations imposed upon them by conventional morality and social norms. In other words, the ubermensch would be the creator of their own values, embracing life's challenges and affirming their desires and instincts, like the transhumanists. Why did Nietzsche proclaim the death of God? We all know Nietzsche proclaimed the death of God, and we have lot of so we have heard a lot of stories and anecdotes connected with it. But why did Nietzsche proclaim the death of God? By death of God, does he mean only the death of religion? Absolutely no. By death of God, he is referring not only to the death of religion, but also, interestingly, of the death of science. So, obviously, Nietzsche wouldn't have supported the transhumanist idea that we can replace religion with science. No. Nietzsche's God is an external authority imposing their truth on the individual. In other words, the death of God should be approached, should be understood as a metaphor to reject any external imposition upon our own life. And uh, this advocates, you know, it in, instead it advocates trying to find out our own individual voices, not the voice of God, our own individual voices. So the death of an external truth allows for the birth of the ubermensch or the fully empowered individual. This is the extraordinary gift bestowed upon us by the wonderful, immortally mortal Nietzsche, the gift called the, the superman and the ubermensch. And isn't this ubermensch very similar to the post-human that we are trying to create? In fact, according to Nietzsche, God didn't just die. We have killed him. That is what Nietzsche says. We have killed God. But who is this we? You killed God? Who killed God? Did you? Did you kill God? Did you kill the human? When someone talks about death, it means that someone has survived because only the survivor can talk about death. So who is the survivor in the death of God as well as the death of man? 
the answer is there for everyone to see. I won't name it. Who is the survivor in the death of God and death of man? Although anti-humanism does locate itself in the death of God and also in the death of human, post-humanism does not. Post-humanism doesn't have anything to do with death of God or death of man, but transhumanism has. No, no, not transhumanism. Anti-humanism locates itself within death of God and death of the human. More questions. If we have the power to kill immortal gods, who are we? Who are we? If we have the power to kill immortal gods, aren't we immortal gods ourselves? But then, if we are gods, shouldn't we behave like gods? You know, the traditional idea of God. Are we behaving like gods? The whole discussion is about or revolves around the fusion of spirituality and technology. And uh, here I would invite your attention to an amazing book. Amazing. I would recommend this to everyone who is listening to this lecture. Uh, this book is titled The Religion of Technology. It has a subtitle to The Divinity of Man and the Spirit of Invention. Uh, it, it's there in the handout. So uh, this book is written by um, David Noble, N-O-B-L-E, and it was brought out by Penguin in uh, 1997. So at the close of the millennium, 1997, David Noble explored the spiritual underpinnings behind the modern technological vision, the religion of technology, spiritual aspects behind technology. In the book's introduction, Noble comments on the strange fusion of rationalism or scientism and spirituality that now animates the technocratic impulse, if I may call it so. So uh, this is what uh, David Noble says, and I quote, although today's technologists in their sober pursuit of utility, power, and profit, seem to set society's standard for rationality, they are driven also by distant dreams and spiritual yearnings for supernatural redemption. It continues, however dazzling and daunting their display of worldly wisdom, their true inspiration lies elsewhere in an enduring otherworldly quest for transcendence and salvation. What is this technology doing? You know, he's surprised, I guess. He says, you know, yeah, these technologists are, uh, are going after power, profit, uh, all these things. They are after science, scientific things. But they are also driven by dreams. They are also driven by spiritual yearnings. They want spiritual redemption, supernatural redemption. And though we are, we have on the one hand worldly wisdom, the inspiration behind it is often in an otherworldly quest for salvation, transcendence. And isn't it interesting, my dear friends, because uh, the Gen C, the Gen is said, if I may call so, uh, Noble finds something strange and weird with the Gen C. What is it? He, he, he says, again, I'm quoting from Noble, David Noble, with the approach of the new millennium, we are witnessing two seemingly incompatible enthusiasms. On the one hand, a widespread infatuation with technological advance and a confidence in the ultimate triumph of reason. On the other, a resurgence of fundamental faith akin to a religious revival. The coincidence of these two developments appears strange. However, merely because we mistakenly suppose them to be opposite and opposing historical tendencies. So the problem is with us. We think that technology and religious revival would not go together. We think that these are opposites. 
but these two coincide in the during the turn of the millennium during the beginning or the at the end and the beginning of the 21st century now uh, if you look at facebook for example not so long ago mark zuckerberg suggested technology as the answer to our spiritual longings through a series of crazy weird creations through apps that enable us to pray through machines through conversations with you know uh, church leaders about how facebook can enhance our worship worship what zuckerberg suggested technology as a solution to our spiritual longings and uh, you know uh, a, a, an interesting uh, write up was there in in the new york times written by uh, elizabeth dies uh, where she pointed out that facebook is trying to shape the future of religious experience itself as it has done for political and social life maybe not exactly for us but for many in the west facebook is already the face of religious experience and what about us more and more aspects of our life whether it is about getting a job whether it is about earning money whether it is about our ability to take a loan borrow money give money and or even our ability to share our opinions we have to always worry about terms and conditions we get occasionally blocked and temporarily suspended why why all these things happen we have become contingent our the many aspects almost all aspects of our life have become contingent on how we in relation to the ecosystem of data in the cloud and we have begun looking at the bots 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 that control this ecosystem much like how our ancestors would look upon angelic and demonic forces but even as we are trying to pacify and appease these opaque invisible actors called bots we simultaneously look at look look up to them as our saviors as if they alone can protect us from the correct corrupting forces like memes like fake news like any other infectious content that Uh, is perpetuated through technology now the fear of machines becoming human is balanced by the fear of humans becoming or being controlled by machines on the one hand we are afraid of machines becoming humans on the other we are also afraid of we becoming machines humans are becoming more machine like no question we are unable to think independently we communicate with predictable talking points we we behave at times like machines how many times our partners or friends have told us that you you are you have no emotion you are like a machine you know our behavior most of the time mimics the behavior of bots and that is why media scholars these days are looking at vocabulary uh, to explain this quasi spiritual demonic language you know demonic ways of modern man modern in the sense 21st century man meanwhile as more aspects of reality come to be mediated through machines the distinction between the real and the unreal actuality and simulation real life and ai reality and fakeness are becoming not only porous but trivial and irrelevant to many modern you know the, the children these days most often don't know the difference between real life and artificial intelligence actuality and simulation what is simulated and what is actual is there anything actual the next holy grail of the tech industry is actually to erase the distinction between real life and simulation because simulations are becoming more and more real and we are all like primitive savages 
whose walls were haunted by demons and shadowy forces. And very soon, we may live in a shadowy nether world where the phantasmic is mistaken for the real. We will never know whether we are real or we are ethereal. We are the, fan the phantom. We are the phantasmic. We are the simulation. We have such stories. Right? This is the dark turn implicated by the future fusion of the spiritual and the technological. I hope I'm making some sense. A fusion that presents the ultimate paradox, spiritual technology, technological spirituality. Yet, hope is not lost. We know, you know, history tells us or teaches us certain lessons. We know that the disruption of order and the disintegration of value systems, what we call decadence, decadence is not the end. After chaos, there is always creation. The book of Genesis. After Babel, there is the Pentecost. After exile, there is Epiphany. The seeds of logos, though often invisible, are at work even when and perhaps especially when the forces of unreality seem the strongest. Knowledge cannot die. Knowledge cannot give up. Wisdom cannot give up. And that is where we have the hope. Yes, things fall apart. Yes, the center cannot hold and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. But the only question that remains to be answered, and here I wind up, is perhaps who this new Devus Ex Machina will be. Who will be the new God descending from the machine, descending upon the mortal world of immortal mortals known as post-humans? I don't have an answer, but I, have, but I know how to phrase the question better, thanks to William Butler Yeats's poem, The Second Coming. I will rephrase the question like this. What rough beast, its hour come around at last, slouches towards Bethlehem, to be born. Thank you. Thank you. That ends this lecture. Thank you so Thank much you. for your patient listening. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, Richu, you are audible. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much for that exciting talk and uh, leaving us all in, in uh, perils of hell on, uh, uh, on giving us enough points to wonder about the creation of God, the killing of God, the birth of God, and uh, well, uh, making us more porous to the realities of technologies and uh, well let's ha uh, let's hope that we will have more epiphanic moments on technology uh, while we have more uh, uh, eager participants who are very uh, uh, enthusiastic to share your questions i would like to start with chirag sharma's comment uh, who would like to describe this lecture through galib's lines humko malum hai jannat ki haqeeqat lekin dil ko khush karne ko ye khayal acha hai uh, you are getting uh, uh, compliments and uh, well, uh, there are questions also in line. So uh, first off, I'd like to start off with Alan, Alam Surender's question. Uh, humanism is human-oriented empathy. Post-humanism is empathy to other creatures. It's humans created technology which has been vulnerable to other creatures. Animal kingdom, for example. Please highlight this as one of the components of post-humanist element. Is the question clear? Can you rephrase it or can you say when the question was asked so that I can find the question in the chat? Alam Surender, uh, if you are in this meeting, you can raise your hand so that we can unmute you. You can ask the questions. Alam, are you here? Well, uh, he's, uh, I think he's fundamentally trying. Is he here? Uh, 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 human is, uh, he's fundamentally trying to create this uh, parallel between humanism, which is human-oriented empathy, and uh, post-humanism, which is empathy to other creatures. And uh, this technology itself, uh, uh, technology itself has been vulnerable to other creatures. 
which for example animal kingdom but i think the fundamental distinction is between humanism and post humanism and how empathy is treated in these both realms definitely definitely that is uh, you know that's a beautiful way of uh, phrasing the whole thing you know uh, empathy towards humanism as empathy uh, towards humans and post humanism and as empathy towards uh, other as well other the other as well you know uh, the animals the machines the cyborgs everything yeah, that that's a, a beautiful way to pr- phrase uh, this whole uh, scenario and uh, um, so the question was how would what was the question in that how is this empathy different in the post human setting so next uh, 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 right 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 so uh, the difference is obviously you know when you look at post humanism it is post structuralist it is deconstructive and uh, in the sense you know when we speak about post humanism we often define it as the blurring of the boundaries between the human the animal and the technological now what does this blurring of boundaries imply earlier what we had was an anthropocentric man centric Uh, universe where man was the crown of creation that was what we called humanism so everything else depended on humans and every, you know uh, every other species depended on humans and even nature we hoped that even nature was created for men nature animals technology everything was created for men this was the idea and there was a definite hierarchy but when we come to post humanism it is dis- distinctly deconstructive post structuralist in the sense that it doesn't favor it doesn't privilege anything any side of the slash if if at all there is a slash between man uh, animal and the technological the cyborg these slashes operate in a in, in a continuum and here i would want to say it is more like a you know non dualistic concept in other words you know western metaphysics operated on the idea of dualism binary opposition one thing you know uh, speaking writing dark wh- white uh, black white man woman so one side is privileged and the other side is marginalized however there is a non dualistic way of uh looking at things as well non dualistic in the sense when two parts of the dualism of the binary complete the whole and this idea is beautifully ex- encapsulated in the indian art of uh, you know atmanarishwara another beautiful way and i think it's a very sim- you know a uh, symbolic rep- they have a symbolic representation as well the chinese idea of yin and yang so what happens there is we have a circle and you know if you can just google and see those pictures that would be amazing so yin and yang how they pictureize that and that complementarity two sides completing the whole this is the idea with post humanism i would say not two but multiple things man human man uh, non human um, living non living uh, the technological the all these things coexist in mutual harmony in 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 such a way as in yin and yang that we are not thinking about it as a dualism we are not thinking about it as something binary we are we what we have here you know and uh, the western traditions have many such examples jainism buddhism all these traditions have speak about you know the advaita siddhanta of uh, um, adi shankara all these speak about this non dualistic ways of looking at uh, the binaries and it is here that post humanism makes a lot of sense and and that is probably the most beautiful thing about uh, post humanism that its empathy is not only with the human but also with other uh, other sides of the slash thank you i hope i have answered the question lam surender uh, uh, we hope you have uh, got a con- satisfactory answer if you have in please raise your hand and uh, you uh, we will unmute you we have the facility to unmute you so please feel free to communicate with the speaker now uh, we go to the second question which is uh, raised by abhishekta bandyopadhyaya uh, so as technology has become god does it not enhance the fear of privacy at stake 
we as commoners are we not web arresting ourselves as technology has become the primary aspect of survival how can we fight these fears the fear of hmm. privacy yeah surveillance is very much there privacy questions are very much there and uh, i guess that is one of the biggest threats uh, posed uh, by these technologies lot of questions are asked about privacy and uh, uh, we are still a group of people at least we indians i guess or we are a group of people who wouldn't uh, who would just click on i agree i agree i agree you know when you are installing a software you just click on i agree i agree i agree i agree and you give all the ticks and then everything is fine and we are perfectly watched um, when you go to a margin free market they will say uh, you can enter into a, a contest for that you have to give your uh, email address and uh, then we will also give them the password and then we will give them the uh, atm uh, uh, atm pin also because we are very generous so Uh, that is the way we are we are uh, on the one hand we are not yet aware of the problems that sharing these details can pose on the other hand if we are aware it is very difficult to leave we might feel extremely uh, claustrophobic we might feel ex- extremely anxious and it is difficult to leave in such a world because uh, for example when i am sitting here and talking i would feel very awkward if someone else outside sitting near me is looking at me i am perfectly fine if you are looking at me you know the screen is looking at me but if somebody sits near me and looks at me it 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 is embarrassing or it is irritating for me so you know now we are in a world where there is a camera everywhere and this camera it, it, it's it's very difficult literally there is a camera everywhere and when you enter a room uh, when you not only when you book a hotel now nowadays when you enter uh, if go to a friend's house and when you are changing your clothes the first thing that you would definitely check is whether there is a camera not that your friend would want to capture uh, you changing but the point is there are cameras everywhere there are uh, cameras cctv cameras everywhere i can see one of them here and the first thing i did uh, the moment i came to this room uh, was to make sure that the camera is turned off not because i am doing something that is that should not be watched of course i do many things that should not be watched that's right but the point is i hate being watched this idea of being watched can make me feel so uncomfortable and so claustrophobic and this is where this technology has completely ruined our life yes uh, we have evidences for everything Uh, in crime scenes it's a big help uh, police can trace everyone there is gps all those things but aren't we also traced very easily and aren't we uh, yielding ourselves giving up ourselves to these technologies of course i don't have answers to your questions yes we are watched uh, we are being arrested uh, you know arrested in a metaphoric sense as well because we are per- you know what are these recording devices do i think we are also immortalized technology immortalizes us yeah, uh, the way kids would speak about immortality in the grecian one you know the pictures are immortalized the lovers kissing are immortalized because they are eternally there similarly technology immortalizes us gives us gives us some sort of immortality which is very unsettling yeah let us ask these questions and uh, measures are necessary ethical yardsticks are needed and technology is growing at a ferocious pace that law is lagging far behind legal measures uh, you know we are still uh, in the 20th century whereas uh, technology is already into the 22nd century so yeah legal side has to step up and and quickly thank you alam again has uh, co- uh, asked Uh, was interested with the concept of panopticon where everyone remains invisible but still they can exercise the power and uh, then it's a series of compliments by agansha pante on a magnificent lecture and uh, our speaker for the first session anna kusia ma'am has uh, thanked you for sharing such an interesting presentation and again by yusuf asis uh, a basic compliment hi chalega shayad bahut sare hai alam sandra okay shadrubha ma'am uh, oh doesn't you mean the Okay, uh, he, uh, Alam has come up with a follow-up question that the 
the empathy between humanism and post humanism does it mean the death of humanity and empathy doesn't no no it, it doesn't mean the death of humanity or the, the death of empathy not at all um, we are speaking of uh, a different kind of vision we are speaking of a different world view we are speaking of a moralistic uh, you know humanistic uh, imagination which encompasses all and i think that's a better empathy it's it's a better form rather than killing empathy or destroying empathy it is a, a better form of empathy but yes uh, it all depends on how one takes it it's a tool and you have a tool the way you wield it decides uh, the results so if you uh, employ it for good purposes it will yield good results otherwise no so uh, i don't think it is bad at all i don't think it kills man in any literal or even a metaphoric sense but yeah uh, there is this figure of the post human looming large on us and sometimes we do not know because let's say for example the romantics didn't know that they were romantics uh, even when uh, you know Uh, this person uh, Will, william wordsworth died in uh, 1850 he didn't know that he was a romanticist later generations called them romanticists and, and when um, you know ts eliot or ayer richards you know those people were speaking about modernism they, they didn't know they were modernists now we are speaking about post humanism we do not know whether we are already post humanists maybe we are or we are just pigments in the image of a future post human you know probably sitting with a sly smile looking at all the troubles and um, all the things that we are doing all the worries and anxieties that we have and and probably he or she knows that or it knows that it's all useless we are just doing something as flies to want in boys or we are like puppets in the hands of some future post human so it's interesting but yes sir and i would like to add to add to that with the fact that well it's not technology that is good or evil uh, for example you started with the concept of prometheus the fire is not at fault it was prometheus who gave it so we cannot actually implicitly blame technology or chat gpt or the social media who is actually doing the things and exercising the uh, concepts of morality but it is the people who actually created it and who who wielded it it was those originators from where the empathy the uh, humanity and then agangsha pandey has come up with the follow up question about post humanism talks about death of morality or new morality the morality or new morality uh, well um, it, i can't say it it speaks about the death of morality the moral question is uh, slightly different Uh, however um, there is a difference between uh, the different branches within post humanism because uh, post humanism though you know is isn't a single idea isn't a single Id- uh, uh, um, entity where everybody agrees on certain ways of looking at things post humanism is an umbrella under which we have many different ways of looking at things many different perspectives that is why we have to think about what transhumanists would say about morality what posthumanists or philosophical uh, posthumanists would say about morality now philosophical posthumanism which is against uh, which doesn't want to think about things in terms of dualities would say that we don't have any problem with morality we are not against morality we are not supporting morality we don't have anything to do with morality that that just it's not our concern that is probably the way philosophical post humanism would look at it though philosophical post humanism is immensely in, interested in the idea of enlightenment enlightenment you know i think it's very uh, similar to the idea of um, the buddhist notion of uh, enlightenment so uh that is there but when we come to transhumanism there i guess there is a little bit of problem because it is based on uh, atheistic principles now atheism cannot be considered as anti morality because atheism atheists are not um, amoral or immoral people but 
there are certain strands which according to certain ways of beliefs are amoral so for example if i believe that um, you know what should i say uh, if i believe that intersex uh, marriage same sex marriage is wrong as per my religion then it's my view my, my religion teaches me that same sex marriage is wrong so if an ideology is says that same sex marriage is right then my religion would say it is immoral but so who would decide this morality that is also a big problem who decides what is moral and what is immoral should it be decided by the religion should it be decided by the conscience should it be decided by some you know uh, morality in legal terms would be laws l a w s laws so um morality is a very you know fluid term that 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 that, that, that takes the shape of the container in which uh, it is held so morality depends so uh, mormonism for example uh, suggested that um, technology is very good because it is like the, they said it is like the christian idea of rebirth because you are reborn in in technology mormonism so uh, yeah there are uh, certain ways of looking at things religions influence a lot but are religions representative or agents or um, stakeholders in the morality question that's uh, up to everyone to decide for themselves so i don't think it is immoral or anti moral at all but certain strands have certain ways anti humanism too is in some ways it is amoral because it doesn't want to accommodate any sort of authority accommodate any it is all about complete liberty complete freedom from all external authority so yeah these are some things that we can think about yeah I have six questions and five minutes, and uh, I will just uh, bunch the questions together so it will be easier for you to answer. Uh, Barnali, uh, more uh, compliments to you by the way. Barnali Patnaik says that uh, 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 in a world full of genetically engineered humans, what will be the state of religion, spirituality, and the idea of God? Or will the conventional idea of God cease? to exist and along with that i'll take aishwarya's question too if post humanism centers on the idea of humans transcending limitations and evolving into new forms will there be no need for deus ex machina in new narratives do you think the emphasis uh, is it too much or should i continue the question do you think the emphasis on exploring the potential of humanity and its creation rather than relying on external divine interventions can you dance exactly uh, the first question um, what was the first? It, it it was about um, yeah i mean the whole lecture today I, i mean i was looking at how god is portrayed and how religion morality spirituality all these would or is seen are seen in a post human world so on the one hand on one hand we have the post the idea of the post human god uh on the other hand we have humans playing god uh, on the on on yet another angle we have humans being gods and becoming gods so all these things are happening within post humanism so uh it is quite interesting in the sense that it it creates different versions of understanding god and spirituality and mysticism uh but we have to take everything with a pinch of salt we have to be wary of the pitfalls as well because every step we take can you know it, it's like we can no longer take a step back uh, earlier generations always had the option to switch off the computer if something goes wrong but now even if we switch off the computer the computer will still process in the cloud and then what will happen uh in in the cloud it will process and it will do it and whatever instruction you have given it it will do it so this is one problem in a technocentric world so we have to be extremely uh, wary of it regarding the second question do we need external or divine external divine intervention today uh, now what is this divine intervention if you look at technology as not external to man i think that would be the right way to look at it as well because technology is 
uh, inextricably a human thing. Doing technology is also a part of what it means to be a human being. So if you look at it like that, then no, we don't need any external aid. We don't need another uh, devus ex machina because we are probably the devus's ex machina. We are the gods from the machines. And, uh, um, you know, uh, when we speak about IVF or the different ways, uh, embryonics and things like that, we are seeing how babies are born from machines. Right. Babies are born from machines, babies are nourished by machines, and these grown-up babies are further nourishing themselves and uh, living on machines. So yeah, uh, we may not need an external uh, divine intervention. You know, in a post-humanist sense, it is all fine. But uh, after all, there is always this idea that, yeah, it is these, are, these are all good theoretically, but practically, what is the thing? And as Shulamit Firestone once said, this is my theory and that is my practice. There, are, there is no connection between my theory and my practice. We learn these things, we enjoy these uh, strands of knowledge and there is no question that we are part of it, but definitely uh, um, we have to know that it is certain things are theoretical and it is not just about absorbing everything. It is not just about mugging up uh, the whole thing and living a life like that. I guess we are time. Uh, but I like to bunch together a couple of questions uh, regarding uh, known. Uh, Harida wants to know about dualism and post dualism. And uh, Andy Bardwaj asked if uh, technology and post humanism is a solution to protecting us from uh, extinction. And uh, Chirag asked if uh, the idea of technology as God is the whole idea of technology that uh, God is more poetical, is much more poetical and hypothetical than realistic. I think my brain now resembles uh, a, a computer that shows uh, like this. My brain <laughs> is hanging. A uh, lot of questions are uh, hanging. So, and and we ask, do you think technology and posthumanism is the solution to protecting us from extinction? Why not? That is one way of looking at uh, technology because uh, there are multiple sci-fi narratives and stories and you know a lot of things movies even uh, where we see that uh, technology uh, inspired ai ais in turn protect humanity from self de destroying itself protecting humanity from an implosion because um, some you know these these stories would tell us that actually humanity is uh, on the verge of extinction and that is when, uh, you know, not the Terminator, but the opposite of the Terminator would appear and save us, save us from all this. So sometimes, yes, technology can be the savior to technology can prevent us from uh, getting uh, extinct. All these things are possible. And um, God is much more poetical. And OK, technology as God is much more poetical and hypothetical than realistic. Yes, Chira, definitely. Uh, it is. I don't want to think of uh, God as, uh, you know, technology as God in a realistic sense. Yes, it is poetic. We can make uh, interesting parallels and comparisons. Uh, but my God is not uh, technology. I, I, you know, I may say so. I don't know whether I'm practicing it, but my God is not technology. But yeah, the idea of technology as God is beautiful. The idea of technology as God is techno-enchanting. And the, the engineered paradise, created technology is beautiful to live. But whether we will be there and how we will be living there is anybody's guess. Thank you. So uh, I think Richu is giving me bunches of questions yeah, in, the rose, in the form of not bunches of roses, but bunches of thorns. So uh, I Another hope that we are done question. with the questions. By Anne, yes. utilitarianism? Yeah. In simple terms, is a philosophy that is centered on reducing the suffering and increasing the happiness of the majority. It is built on a logical fallacy of thought, which is belief in a just world and also the usual debunked atheist idea of appeal to suffering and evil to deny the existence of God. 
the same philosophy can be used to deny even basic rights of life it's very selective and toxic say a person who is disabled is in suffering and ruins the happiness so so their sense can be eliminated in a human centric world where do you have discarded the idea of god who or what is the center of all moral values how can you make value based judgment if technology becomes god and how can anyone argue for their right to exist as to who they are when it took on god you should have expected that these questions would come in well uh, i think these are questions that we all need to ask um you know thankfully uh, the best thing about it is uh, these things are uh, helping us ask questions an earlier generation would look at answers but our generation needs questions because we no longer ask questions we are, we are no longer worried so the point is we need questions and these are the questions that we would want to ask and i don't have answers to any of these questions i don't know uh, the answers to any of these questions either i may have my own perspectives on this thing but i think this whatever you said uh, i i i think uh, the utilitarian idea the hedonistic uh, principle uh, all these things as are you know kind of trying to uh, evade or um, take away god uh, from the whole picture spirituality from the whole picture i agree with all of those ideas but the questions at the end are extremely unsettling and extremely interesting as well and that is probably where um, a lecture should end with more questions than answers uh, so let us uh, be like newton why did this apple fall down let us ask uh why did not not um, steve jobs apple uh, but this apple of questions uh why did why did this fall down and why don't we have answers and let the search for answers to these questions yield more questions let's live in a world of questions and let's understand that it's okay to not have answers to all questions thank you diplomatic as always now i invite shatrubha ma'am uh shadrubha ma'am would you raise your hand and so that we can unmute you shadrubha ma'am are you here are you able to talk i guess she is speechless oh. well then i would like to deliver the concluding uh, uh statement so for piester in 1950 had uh where well, he was worried about the evolution of technology and he said well it is not an exaggeration to say that the future of modern society and the stability of its inner life depend in large part on the maintenance of an equilibrium between the strength of the techniques of communication and the capacity of the individuals on reality and reaction so uh, uh i believe that this session has empowered us enough to well ignite uh, our own questions about the uh, concept of post humanism and state our own reactions about uh, uh, about all the wonderful sessions that are going to come and uh, uh, i hope that there will be more much more exciting questions about uh, the, the sessions the future sessions 